Folks, as we uh, go to the Lord in prayer, uh, you know, I was looking at our, our uh, looking at the lyrics of the opening song. Our God is greater. Our God is stronger. Our God is higher. Our God is healer. Our God is helper. Uh, all of that and more so than that, right? So with that thought, uh, let's unite our hearts and our minds in prayer. Heavenly Father, uh, this morning we gather in your house and we want to acknowledge you as the greatest one in the universe, the one who has revealed himself through the person of Jesus Christ to us. You're greater, you're stronger, you're higher, uh, your thoughts are higher, your ways are higher. You're our helper, our God, our strength, our rock, our refuge, our fortress, our deliverer, uh, the one in whom we trust. You're our stronghold. Uh, Lord, we need you so, so much, and that's why we're here today. Uh, we want to acknowledge who you are, and we want to acknowledge that we need your help. Uh, we've needed your help in salvation. Uh, we need your help in walking in the Spirit. Uh, we need your help to let our light shine before men. Uh, we need to be reminded that you're for us and not against us. Uh, we need to be reminded that nothing can separate us from your love. Uh, all the promises of Scripture, Lord, uh, we need to be reminded of them. And that's why we're here. Uh, we want to lift up Christ this morning, the author and the giver of life, uh, the Alpha and the Omega, the one who was resurrected from the dead, and the one who gives us the abundant life here and now, who offers it here and now, who offers the gift of eternal life here and now. And we bless you and thank you for that day when we first believed uh, and how it's changed our life and our heart and it's given us a song in our heart, it's given us hope in our heart, it's given us joy in our heart and peace in our heart. And we just can't imagine living life without you. And uh, so that's why we're here, Lord, uh, to bless you and to acknowledge you in our lives and acknowledge you as to who you are and acknowledge you that, uh, to acknowledge you that all good things come from you. Uh, Father, thank you uh, for uh, Edith uh, uh, Perfetti being here today, and Edie Jackson and Eileen Kramer. Uh, we bless you uh, that you've given them the strength and the health to be here this day. And also, Lord, for the many others that have uh, uh, daily struggles physically, uh, we, uh, we thank you for uh, the way in which you provide uh, perseverance and endurance and physical strength uh, to be here today. Uh, also, Father, um, may we be ever mindful that in our weakness, you're made strong. Uh, and as we, as we rest, as we abide, uh, as we worship, Lord, we trust that you will carry things out uh, to completion as we wait upon you, uh, as you move, uh, we know that you always provide and you have an answer for all of our infirmities, all of our struggles, all of our trials, and we bless you for that. Also, Lord, too, uh, we're ever mindful of the times in which we live, uh, the concern uh, for our country, uh, the divisiveness, the division, uh, also, Lord, uh, the concern for uh, violence in the coming days. And, uh, Lord, we know that we're uh, reaping what we've sown. And uh, all we can ask is that uh, you would be so gracious and so merciful 
to stem the division and, uh, and to stem any violence. Uh, we ask Heavenly Father that you would visit our country uh, in, in the way of peace and the way of unity and that you would eliminate the turmoil and all the division. Uh, nothing is impossible with you. Uh, that's our prayer, and yet uh, we pray that your will be done. Uh, we know that uh, there are times where uh, you just let nations go their own way and people go their own way uh, as the uh, fruit of uh, their reward. And, um, but we lift up our country this morning, and we pray that you would be pleased and move to bring healing. I also pray, Lord, too, that you would bring healing to our hearts uh, for all the scars, uh, all the wounds uh, that uh, we've uh, experienced uh, in life, in the Christian life, the mistakes that we've made, um, the situations that we've created through bad decisions and bad choices. Uh, we thank you that um, you're working through all of that to change our hearts, uh, to shape our hearts. Uh, to give uh, glory to Christ, and we bless you for that. Uh, thank you for your presence this hour, this day. May we sense your presence, and may your peace be upon our hearts in full measure, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, uh, we're going to have our first reading this morning. Bill? Our first reading this morning is from the first book of Exodus, verses 8 through 22, and that's on page 55 of the Red Church Bible. Then a new king, who did not know about Joseph, came to power in Egypt. Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become much too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them, or they will become even more numerous, and if war breaks out, will join our enemies, fight against us, and leave the country. So they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor, and they built Python and Ramses as store cities for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and worked them ruthlessly. They made their lives bitter with hard labor in brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in the fields. In all their hard labor, the Egyptians used them ruthlessly. The king of Egypt said to Hebrew midwives, whose names were Shifra and Pua, when you help the Hebrew women in childbirth and observe them on the delivery stool, if it is a boy, kill him. But if it's a girl, let her live. The midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. When the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and asked them, why have you done this? Why have you let the boys live? The midwives answered Pharaoh, Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women. They are vigorous and give birth before the midwives arrive. So God was kind to the midwives and the people increased and became even more numerous. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families of their own. Then Pharaoh gave this order to all his people. Every boy that is born, you must throw into the Nile, but let every girl live. This is the word of our Lord. This morning's second scripture reading continues in the book of Exodus. Be reading the first ten verses of the second chapter, and that starts on page 55. Again, the first ten verses of the second chapter. Now, a man 
of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the banks of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the riverbank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her female slave to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying, and she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, go, she answered. So the girl went and got the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this baby and nurse him for me, and I will pay you. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. When the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Thanks, Dave. Let's have a word of prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, I, you know my heart. And I pray that what I say this morning would be to the glory of Christ and your people. And we give you this time, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So folks, uh, as we sang earlier, uh, in times like these, you need a Savior, an anchor, the Bible, and be not idle. And this passage uh, before us, uh, Exodus chapter 2, Verses 1 through 10 has a little bit of everything for the times in which we live. I'd like to summarize uh, Exodus 1 and 2 very quickly, uh, or at least the first half of chapter 2. But the nation is in the land of Egypt. They're multiplying, and so hardship is put upon the, the uh, Hebrews. Multiple hardship, and so they multiply even more. And so what we have here is an edict uh, for partial birth abortion. When the baby's coming out of the womb, if it's a male, kill it. And, if, um, uh, and, and, so, and so when that didn't work, because the midwives would have no part in it, uh, we see that an edict was issued to just throw them in the river. Talk about a throwaway society, right? It also was true back then. So there are four principles here this morning that I'd like to uh, highlight. Uh, the first one is choosing life. The second one is choosing God over the state. Uh, the third one is exercising faith. And the fourth one is having a plan. Uh, in times like these, this is what I believe the people of God need to do. Uh, number one, point number one, choosing life. Uh, you may know, but today is the third Sunday in January, and it has been designated as the Sanctity of Life Sunday. And we honor life. Uh, this is a classic and appropriate passage to talk about today. Uh, we live in a nation that has lost its way morally. We throw away babies. We throw away everything. Abortion is wicked, and it's sick. And to think that they have made it legal it's amazing what you do when you pass laws. And I guess they can make it anything that they want. Uh, if you take a look at your handout in the bulletin this morning, uh, this is exactly the reason for the handout and bringing this topic up this morning. Uh, we cannot forget it. We cannot emotionally and morally and spiritually sweep the dirt under the rug. Abortion is wicked and it's immoral. And God help us, if we vote for anybody, 
that promotes a stance on abortion. Well, they're going to give me a little bit more in my social security check or my paycheck or promise, makes all sorts of promises. God's not going to bless that. He's not going to bless it. He doesn't bless the taking of a life like that. Uh, the article before you is one year old. It was written by somebody with the Texas Right to Life movement. And I chose this because I thought it had a very, very nice, terse, uh, but good summary of the history of abortion and the godless Supreme Court ruling in 1973. And I say godless with capital letters. It was godless. The abortion stats in the article, this is last year now, 61,628,584 babies. By my calculations, by February 2nd of this year, 2021, we will be over 63 million. That should bring pause to every person, and it should, whether you're a believer or an unbeliever. Uh, I would challenge anybody, and I can't even do this myself, uh, to take a look at an, a video of that procedure. I can't do it because it just, I would vomit. It's disgusting. It's godless to some, think that uh, somebody would do that to another human being. It should bring tears to our eyes. Seven out of ten babies that are aborted are black. Yeah, black lives matter, right? I've decided, uh, I decided when I was preparing this message to think, how many were actually killed in World War II? How many people? A uh, quick number I found on the internet, 75 million people died in World War II. And the irony of all this, right? We call Adolf Hitler a monster, but abortion's a right. It's a pretty amazing contrast. Uh, let's be honest, abortion is nothing less than legalized murder of the innocent who have no voice of their own. What does this say about our society? What does this say about our courts? What does this say about some of our leaders? What does this say about our laws, our philosophy, and our way of life? What we were founded on has not, is not what we have become. Choosing life is actually a choice that's put forth in Scripture. Choose Jesus Christ. He's the author and the giver of life. In Deuteronomy, Moses said to the people, choose life or death. This is essentially the, Christian, uh, the theme of the Christian life. Choose life or death. Uh, and the choice comes down sometimes to God and the state. Uh, most of us have seen that bumper sticker, uh, choose life, your mother did. It says it all. Moses' mother, she chose life during a very, very difficult time. What a great model for all women, Christian and unchristian. What a great model. She stood for life in a culture of death. That's what we live in today, a culture of death. Now, it really never dawned on me in looking at this passage until actually preparing this message. But there's actually a picture of death and resurrection in this passage. We have an edict in chapter 1 issued by Pharaoh, uh, the king, the state, to kill all the male children. That was also true in Jesus' day. You ever see that parallel? Moses was under a death sentence when he was born. Jesus was under a death sentence when he was born. Both heads of state seek to kill a savior. And here's the resurrection motif. God in his providence raises up the life of Moses. He brings him back from the dead, if you will. Like he did with Jesus. Like he did with Isaac like he did with Daniel, like he did with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, like he did with the Apostle Paul when he was stoned to death, and like he has done for you and me. 
Now, I'm talking spiritually, of course. Right? He brings us back from the dead by giving us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? We can say that with all the saints. I don't look forward to how I die, where I die, when I die, or with whom I die, or by myself. But I'll tell you what, I do look forward because what, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I can't wait some days. Right, Harold? Moses' mother is named Jochebed. Uh, we know this from Exodus chapter 6 and Numbers 26. She's actually mentioned by name. But I want you to think about this. She and her husband both put their lives in jeopardy by choosing life. They defied the edict of the king. They refused to throw their loved one, their child, in the river. The Hebrew midwives also chose not to partake in the killing of babies. They feared God. They wanted no part of it. That's how I feel. Amen? No part of it. They sought to do the right thing. Even, listen, even Pharaoh's daughter did not want to take part in the killing of children. It's an amazing passage of scripture. We'll talk about defying a godless edict in a minute. But they chose life, and, and may we remember this morning that God is about life. The devil stands for death. A, a thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. The abortion movement is from the pit of hell. It's demonic. It's not of God. It doesn't stand for life. But Jesus Christ has come to give us life more abundantly. During this uh, period of the great COVID lie, and I mean lie, listen to these statistics. The ACLJ, which is the American Center for Law and Justice, it's actually a Christian advocacy organization. Its founder is Jay Sekulow. His son Jordan writes, just this past, uh, the other day I got an email, Quote, according to a new report, abortion is now the world's leading cause of death, not COVID, accounting for nearly 42% of all deaths worldwide in 2020. Let that sink in for a moment, he writes. That's almost half, more than cancer, more than heart disease, more than any criminal violence. In 2020, our entire country, and indeed the world, was forced to shut down to stop the spread of COVID-19 virus. Classrooms were closed. Small businesses and restaurants were forced to close. In some cases, forever. Travel was restricted, and we're all urged to wear face coverings, continually wash and sanitize our hands, and stay away from each other as much as possible. And countless of out-of-work families have been left struggling to pay bills and keep roofs over their heads. All of this resulting from precautions placed by the government to fight a worldwide pandemic, which has reportedly just taken over 1.9 million lives worldwide. We don't say that lightly or to try to downplay that ha uh, haunting number, Jordan writes. The loss of life is horrific and even one death would have been too many. So how is... But so how is it that an astounding, get this, 42.6 million babies were aborted and killed in 2020 worldwide? According to the latest report, which notes that all other deaths combined were 59 million. 59 million versus 42.6. Not a single mandate was announced or abortion businesses were forced to close. See the contrast? A culture of death. What hypocrisy. 42.6 million to 1.9 million. That's an over 20 times higher rate than COVID-19. And yet they have a cow over COVID-19. Comically, what we actually hear, this is what the phrase, follow the science, follow the science, right? 
if they were truly to follow the science, you would not have COVID-19 lockdowns. I recommend the book, COVID-19 Red Pilled. Get it, you can get it uh, on Barnes and Noble. Amazon shut it down like they do everything else. But if we followed the science, we wouldn't have the practice of abortion either. It would be outlawed based on the science. Consider the development of life in the womb. The first month, actualization, conception, all the human DNA code is present. Within a week, you have implantation in the womb. At three weeks, the heart muscle is pulsating. By the fourth week, you have head, arms, and legs. They begin to appear. Second month, you have development. Brain waves can be detected by six weeks. Nose, eyes, ears, and toes appear. A fully developed heart actually beats, and the child has its own blood type. The skeleton develops. A unique set of fingerprints is present. There is sensitivity to touch and reflexes. All bodily systems are present and functioning. The third month, there's movement. There is swallowing, squints, swimming takes place. Hand grafts occur. Also, tongue movement. A child can even suck their thumb at this time. The baby can have an attack of hiccups. Organic pain can be experienced. Fourth month, the time of growth, weight is increased six times. The baby grows eight to ten inches during this time and hear its mother's voice. Fifth month, viability, skin, hair, nails develop. Baby dreams. The baby can cry if air is present and the baby can live outside the womb. And we abort way beyond that. That's sick. That's disgusting. That's demonic. From a biological viewpoint, there is no difference between the child in the womb and the child outside the womb. There is no difference, scripture makes no difference between the words used for children in the womb and children outside the womb. No difference. And the word of God stands forever. Amen? No difference. I pray we do follow the science. I pray that Roe versus Wade is reheard based on the science. In choosing life, Moses' parents, the midwives, and Pharaoh's daughter chose to follow God rather than Pharaoh and the state. That's my second point here, choosing God over the state. These people intentionally, if you read the account, intentionally and consciously defied Pharaoh's edict. God over the state and God over the political winds of the day. We'll see how many put up with God. We'll see how many shut up with God. We're living in a time, folks, where maybe someday we have to make a choice between God and the state. It's coming fast. Now, I hope it doesn't happen. But it's coming fast. If you were to ask many Christians and people in general, should you, should you obey government? They'll say, oh yeah, yeah, you've got to obey government, right? You've got to follow government. And the appeal is often made to Romans chapter 13. Read Romans 13, the first six verses or so, or seven verses. It may surprise you, but Romans 13 never says that Christians are to obey the government. Never says that. Never uses the word obey. It says, submit to the ruling authorities. It says, be in subjection to. And it implies obedience up to a certain point. That's what it implies. If you take a look at the context of Romans 13, government is to be an agent for good. It's to be an agent of God. It never addresses defiance or speaks to not following government in that passage. Because if you read it, Government is supposed to be an agent of righteousness. That's what it's supposed to be. It's under the authority of God as we live in a fallen world. And when government moves itself outside of God's authority, moves it from under God's authority outside of God's authority, then you don't follow that, that authority. I wouldn't expect my wife to follow me if I'm godless. Would you, Jerry? There you go. 
Women, would you follow your, your, your husbands if they were godless? No, of course not. By the way, I just want you to know I wouldn't follow her if she was godless either. <laughs> Government is under God's authority. It's supposed to do the right thing. In other words, subjection until it is never obey. Because if it were, then that would mean we obey government over God, the world over God, the sin choices over God, and may it never be. May it never be. History is full of tyrants that have disregarded the word of God. And when they do not legislate on God's behalf and under his ordained authority, they lose their moral, moral authority to govern. That's it. They've lost it. Therefore, a king's edict should never be in defiance of the word of God. That's not a good king. That's a wicked king. And when it is, we need to make a choice. Whether we follow God or we follow man. And it's clear, if you were to read the scriptures, it's clear that we are to choose God over the state. God over Pharaoh. God over the king. Let me give you some scriptures that speak to obeying God rather than tyrannical decrees. Exodus chapter 2, this is one such passage before us. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, remember? They would not bow down to the statue. They were thrown in the fiery furnace. Daniel refused to not pray in public. He was thrown into the lion's den. 1 Samuel 14, the soldiers refused to obey Saul's edict. And remember, Saul said, you know, pursue the enemy and, 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 until we get them. And no eat, no, eat nothing. Well, Jonathan had some honey. And Jonathan revived. And Jonathan theoretically should have been put to death because he defied the king. And the soldiers wouldn't support Saul's edict. They rebelled. Uh, Esther chapter 1 and chapter 4, you have queens that defied the king's edict. One queen was asked to strip before the king. She said no. It was probably off with her head. And then Esther uh, was uh, basically uh, went before the king without having permission to go before the king. She defied a king's edict. And she was given favor before God. Otherwise, it would have been off with her head. Matthew chapter 2. The wise men, what did they do? Did they listen to Herod? No, they listened to God. Mark chapter 2, Jesus and his disciples picked grain on the Sabbath. They didn't follow an ungodly law. Acts 4, Peter and John said that they would not stop speaking the gospel. Uh, they'd rather obey God than men. Acts 16, Paul defied the authorities and preached the gospel. He was thrown in jail. Great, great precedent for saying no to Caesar at a certain point. <coughs> Someone wrote, quote, man's law cannot dictate our ethics. There will be times when it is designed to stop us from pursuing God and his law and his love, the law of his love. Then we will have to make a choice. There's always a right and proper time to make a choice to choose God over Pharaoh's godless edict. Point number three here, exercising faith. If you take a look at the midwives, the parents, and even, I'm going to suggest, Pharaoh's daughter, they exercised faith. They chose to live by faith. If you read Hebrews 11 again and again, read it. By faith, by faith, by faith. And it was always in the midst of varying circumstances. And they acted. They acted. And I would suggest to you in Exodus chapter 2 that you're going to see a faith played out here. Now, if you, when you read the account, you recognize that many things were outside of their control. And yet their faith, their faith uh, led them through this situation, right? At a certain point, things were outside of their control and they just trust God. That's what they did. But I think they also had a plan. Now more about that plan in a minute, but let's talk about exercising our faith. What do you know in Scripture to be true about faith? Um, I'll share some things that I think you know to be true. You know that your faith that you have is a divine gift. You also know that not everyone has the same faith that you have. 
Not everyone has faith. Jesus spoke of faith the size of a mustard seed or greater as being able to move mountains, to remove obstacles. Faith allows for us to believe in something greater and someone greater. And faith is visionary to be able to take us beyond what we see here and look to God and find strength in Him. Faith makes us depend upon God. Amen? That's what faith is. In this passage, I see tremendous faith in trusting God with the big picture and all the little details. And let me, let me explain that. Uh, first of all, Hebrews 11, 23 tells us that Moses' parents, they walked by faith. They hid Moses for three months by faith. And they were not of the edict, afraid of the edict of Pharaoh, by faith. All in the details, all in the big picture. They were savvy and they were aware that that edict could take their son's life and could take their very lives. But by faith, they dealt with the situation. They didn't let it paralyze them, but they followed through. And this was true for the midwives. You know, I'm really kind of struck here. Did you notice that the midwives, when they went before Pharaoh, they lied? You notice that? They told a fib. A hierarchy of ethics, folks. Love God, love your neighbor. God first, your neighbor second, right? The greatest commandments. Love God, everything else flows from that. They chose life over Pharaoh's edict. They lied. Deception. I love it. I absolutely love it. Now, I wouldn't suggest deception under any grounds except in a hierarchy of ethics here. But saving a life by lying is a much greater and higher ethic. And it was all done in faith, trusting God. You know, those midwives came before the... Pharaoh could have said, Psh, off with your heads. They trusted God in the process. They trusted that God had their back. I want you to stop and think here, because as I read this, I was thinking, I was kind of struck, but I think that everyone involved here had to trust God Almighty to superintend all the events, the details. They were living in difficult times and hardship, trials and tribulation. They had to hide the baby for three months. How do, how do you hide a child for three months without smothering them? I'm sure they didn't have, like, McMansion, right? You know, a 5,000 square foot home. How do you hide a baby for three months? They were living under a death sentence. You ever stop and think of the stress of living under a death sentence? So I would submit to you that faith was exercised daily. And you know what else I see here? How about the faith to take all the, the reeds, the straw, and build a little ark and slap some pitch around it and, and try to make it as best you can? I, I, I was thinking, gee, I wonder if they thought of Noah during this time. You know, uh, the same pitch that Noah put around his ark, they, they did with that. They wove a basket, they covered it, they gave attention to detail, and they trusted God for the rest. Like Noah building the ark. They had to trust that the basket would keep Noah, uh, Moses safe. They had to trust that where they put the basket, that the river wasn't going to, the current wasn't going to take it down the river, the basket. They had to trust that the water wouldn't get into the basket. And they had to trust that somebody was going to find the basket. Big picture, the details. Top to bottom, folks, isn't that our life? You trust God with the big picture and you trust God with all the details. They're outside of our control. You've got to recognize that God has a plan, even when it's found in sinful situations. We just have to ex exercise our faith. If you're between a rock and a hard place, you trust that God will lead you to the rock that's higher than I. When faced with difficulties, you've got to Trust that God has your back covered. Who can cover all the bases except God? Uh, and what I see here is their faith allowed them to see the unseen God as their helper, their guide. 
And that's no different than you and I, right? Uh, Ireland's, um, known as Ireland's greatest theologian, uh, C.H. McIntosh said, quote, Faith can take those bold and lofty flights into regions far removed from this land of death and widespread desolation. Its eagle eye can pierce the gloomy clouds which gather around the tomb and behold the God of resurrection displaying the results of his everlasting counsels in the midst of the spear which no arrow of death can reach. It can take its stand upon the top of rock of ages and listen in holy triumph while the surges of death are lashing at its base. Surges of death and yet resurrection triumph with Moses. That was their faith. That's our faith, folks. And yet, uh, may we echo the words of St. James. What did he say in the epistle of James? Faith without works is dead. Uh, now, before I get into what I think is a plan, I want you to try to capture uh, Jochebed's emotions. Because the, you know, sometimes we read the text and we, you know, we divorce it from our, our personal experiences, right? But uh, the text does not say that she cried. But moms, if you're giving up your child, dads, if you're giving up your child, aren't you emotional about that? Maybe she did cry, but it doesn't say she cried. She was giving up her son. She had to be concerned but thoughtful, contemplated, contemplative yet not overwhelmed. Why is that? Well, I think her faith was coupled with works. And I think Jochebed had a plan. G. Campbell Morgan says, quote, a, a, a scholar years ago wrote, a mother's love is seen scheming for her child. I agree. I see mama bear here with, uh, full of faith and yet full of wisdom. I think she had a plan. She hatched a plan, and, 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 and I look at this passage of Scripture. This is not happenstance that, Joseph, that Moses is just placed in a patch among the reeds. You know, people read this, they say, oh, they just placed them there. Uh, let, me, let me tell you what I think happened. I think Jochebed did her homework. I think Moses was purposely placed in a strategic location. I think Moses was placed in a secure location. I think Moses was placed in a frequented location. And I think Moses was placed in a high probability area where someone would find him. Otherwise, it's reckless abandon. It's reckless faith. Now, I mean, I suppose that God could have kept all those things from happening without a plan, but I see Jochebed as it having a plan. I think that was the intended plan that Pharaoh's daughter would take notice. You ever stop and think about that? And Miriam, she's the security blanket, is she not? She's her mom's eyes and ears of, as to what happens. So what I see here is I see faith plus works plus providence brings about coincidence, right? And so a secure location but an unpredictable river. The palace who frequent the area but totally no guarantee. Miriam taking note, not sure what happens after that, but Miriam taking note. Faith backed by prayer that hopefully Pharaoh's daughter responds. Now, this may seem counterintuitive to say this. How could Moses' parents, if they hatched a plan, how could they trust in Pharaoh's daughter to do the right thing? Would she not follow dad? is not blood thicker than water. Let me, let me share with you what I think is the missing piece of the puzzle here, the story. Because remember, when you read a narrative, you don't get all, you don't get all the details, right? But I think this has great merit. Do you know that Pharaoh's daughter may actually have been a proselyte to the Hebrew faith? In other words, that she became a believer. Now, we don't hear much about that. But according to the Midrash, which is actually a collection of non-legal writings by, by rabbis. It's believed by them that she believed, that, that she believed in Jehovah God. First Chronicles chapter 4, verse 18, 
speaks of Pharaoh's daughter in a Jewish genealogy and how she gave birth to, certain, um, to a certain family line. That's significant. Now, you should be aware of the fact that some are dismissive of this piece of the puzzle, but many are not. And so if Pharaoh's daughter was not a believer, then it's fair to say at some point she probably did become a believer because she's referenced in 1 Chronicles 4, verse 18. And at the very least here, if you read the account, you have compassionate instincts that kick in. I mean, my goodness, we found two kittens in the woodshed and we're raising kittens. If you found a baby at the Nile or on the bank of the Taunton River, would you not raise it or care for it? That's, that's compassionate instincts, right? Maternal instincts kick in. She, had, she had later adopts Moses as her own son. Now, here's the other thing. I see this as a plan. Secure location, strategic location, frequent location. They hatched the plan, but I'm totally convinced that they didn't expect Pharaoh's daughter to pay wages to nurse Moses. And I'm totally convinced that Miriam running up and saying, oh, well, should I find a Hebrew woman? I'm convinced that that may not have been part of the plan either. Either she was quick-witted or that was the line her mother gave her. She was a good actor. But at the very least, at the very least, God gave the whole plan and process favor. But God. And so faith in action Faith and works are in action here. It's a well thought through plan. Prayer, hope, and faith are integrated into that plan. I mean, what else would you expect from a Christian person or a Hebrew woman? Now, here's the other thing I want to mention too. According to Egyptian customs, Pharaoh's daughter probably had her own place. She had her own attendants, and according to customs, she probably had her own place. And so at some particular point here, folks, if you think about the daughter, did she not have to trust God? I mean, she has Moses, a Hebrew, and she's raising him. Pharaoh, at some point, had to find out. She's raising a Hebrew. That's against my orders. I had him, once had him all killed. I had to have him all killed. And so Pharaoh's daughter would have to trust God for the impossible. And so what I see here is even she chose life over death, a Hebrew over her own ethnicity, and possibly her own faith, like Moses, over the treasures of Egypt. Do you know that the rabbis refer to Pharaoh's daughter as a daughter of Jehovah? That's in the Midrash. It's not scripture, but that's the general interpretation. Alexander McLaurin, another scholar, wrote this years ago, the current in the full river, the lie of the flags that stop it from being borne down, that is, the ark among the reeds to keep it from flowing down the river, the hour of the princess's bath, the direction of her idle glance, the cry of the child at the right moment, the impulse welling up in her heart, the swift resolve, the innocent, diplomacy on, on behalf of Miriam, the shelter of the happy mother's breast, the safety of the palace. God works it all together, doesn't he? He brings it all together. Big picture details right down to the very jot and tittle. It was executed, but God. Now, very quickly before I close, you've, you, if you follow sports, or maybe you've heard this expression, but a lot of times leading up to the big game or whatever, they talk about, and I've referred to this before, the game or the plan within the plan, the game within the game. And what they do is they talk about matchups and they talk about you know, strategy and they talk about various plays and all that stuff. But it's called the game within the game. I see a plan within the plan here. I think it was a God-honoring plan to choose life. Ironically, instead of throwing Moses in the river, they place him in the river. It's kind of cool, right? It was well thought out. It was done by faith. 
and God would have to move it forward. I didn't know where God was going to take me this past week, and I was praying, and I was reading, and I was studying, and he gave me this passage. I think it's very, very appropriate in times like these, for our times, folks. It's about choosing life. It's about choosing God over the state. It's about exercising faith. And it's about not being idle, but having a plan. Do you have a plan? What happens if they come and knock on your door tomorrow or come to burn your house down? Remember I used the analogy last week about the Patriot movie, the movie The Patriot? You know, a lot of times people just don't want to get involved, right? We just want to live in, just leave me alone. But what happens if they knock on your door tomorrow? Do you have a plan? Do you have faith? Are you going to choose God? Are you going to choose life? You know, we talk about the parting of the Red Sea. You, you, talk, you, you wait, you'll see the parting of the church. We'll see who the true church is. And who just gives lip service to the church and to God. Think through the consequences of deciding when Caesar has overstepped that God-honoring line. And when you say no. I'm thinking through it. I've got a plan. It's not totally complete, but I've got a plan. I've got faith. I've got God. I'm choosing God. This, this, all this is coming down. Have in your mind who, what, when, where, why, and how. Make sure you've got a great support base. Trust God for the consequences, the choices, the outcomes that you make. Count the cost like the saints in Scripture did. They counted the cost. They put their lives on the line to do the right thing. They had a plan and they followed it. God honored it. Turned out great, didn't it? Anyway, that's what God has laid upon my heart today. Um, let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you that the Holy Scriptures are able to make us wise unto salvation. And we have chosen life in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we choose Jesus. Uh, we know that we didn't choose you, but you chose us. And therefore, we choose Jesus. And we choose you over the state and over the world and over sin and over the king, and over godless edicts. We also, Lord, uh, choose to exercise our faith and our hope. Uh, we choose to pray, and we choose to trust you, and give you our choices, the outcome, the consequences, uh, the cost of, of following you. We bless you for that faith that's able to move mountains. Thank you for this passage of Scripture to encourage our hearts during this time. And Father, I pray that uh, if that time comes where we have to make some real hard choices like Jochebed and her husband and the midwives and Pharaoh's daughter, uh, that you give us a plan. Uh, we thank you for this time. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.